Hello. Today, lecture will address the behavioral objectives for week one in the syllabus. Because the file is so large, this will be presented in two parts. Please make sure to watch both parts to avoid missing critical information. This is part A. So, uh, chapter one, perspectives of pediatric nursing. The major goal for the pediatric nurse is to improve the quality of health care for children and their families. Healthy People 2020 provides indicators for improved health for children. Their goals are to increase quality and length of healthy life and eliminate health disparities. Indicators include physical activity, overweight, obesity, tobacco use, substance abuse, responsible sexual behavior, mental health, injury and violence, environmental quality, immunizations, and access to health care. Childhood health problems include, but are not limited to, obesity and type 2 diabetes. Overweight is considered a BMI of greater than or equal to 85%. Obese is a BMI of 95 equal to um, 95% um, of a BMI. 30% of kids are overweight and 70%, 17% are obese. Many factors contribute to this. Child, childhood injuries. So here, really we know that developmental stage and environment are important determinants in the prevalence of injuries at a given age and thus help to direct preventative measures. Risk-taking behaviors, particularly in males, tend to begin in the first decade of life and continue to into adolescence with drinking alcohol, while driving, speeding, carrying a weapon, or you know, using illicit drugs. Mortality. This is the cause of death in rate per 100,000 population in each age group. The major cause of death in children over one year of age is unintentional injuries. These include motor vehicle accidents, drowning birds, firearms, and poisonings. Overall, the majority being motor vehicle accidents. Just kind of FYI, drowning is a leading cause of accidental death in boys one to four years of age. Violence, unfortunately, is everywhere. The presence of a gun in a household increases the risk of suicide by fivefold and homicide by threefold. Mental health, one out of every five children have mental health problems. One of 10 have a serious emotional problem that affects their daily functioning. Infant mortality. The number of, this is the number of deaths during the first year of life per thousand births. This can be further uh, desegregated into neonatal mortality, which is when a baby is less than 28 days of life. In general, infant mortality includes uh, the causes are congenital an anomalies, low birth weight and problems due to prematurity, newborns affected by maternal complications of pregnancy, number four is sudden infant death syndrome, and number five is unintentional injuries. Childhood mortality overall is unintentional injuries, homicide, and suicide. This can slightly vary within specific age groups. So morbidity, this is an illness or injury with symptoms severe enough to limit or require medical attention. These statistics are used for many reasons. By knowing this information, you can teach families injury prevention measures. Pediatric nursing should provide appropriate care in a supportive environment that promotes the family unit and the child's development. This truly is the art of pediatric nursing. Family-centered care. This basically is the concept of the efforts to address and meet the emotional, social, and developmental needs of children and families seeking health care in all settings. There are two concepts 
Um, one is enabling, which is help families meet needs of self and child. And empowerment, help families gain a sense of control. Professionals enable families by creating opportunities and means for all family members to display their current abilities and competencies and to acquire new ones to meet the needs of the child and the family. Empowerment basically describes the interaction of professionals with families in such a way that families maintain or acquire a sense of control over their families' lives and acknowledge positive changes that result from helping behaviors that foster their own strengths, abilities, and action. These components include, but are not limited to, respect, collaboration, and support. Culturally sensitive care is necessary when family cultural values are incorporated into the FIT care plan. The family is more likely to accept and comply with needed care, especially upon discharge. Upon health behavior patterns, uh, often these are learned from parents and past generations, and these go forth to future generations. A traumatic care provides care through the use of inter interventions that minimize the psychological and physical distress experienced by children and families in the healthcare setting, setting. The United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Child. Basically, this is an instrument to incorporate the full range of human rights for children. All children need to be free from discrimination, to develop physically and mentally in freedom and dignity to have a name and nationality, to have adequate nutrition, housing, recreation, and medical services, to receive special treatment if handicapped, to receive love, understanding, and material security, to receive an education and develop his or her abilities, to be the first to receive protection in a disaster, to be protected from neglect, cruelty, and exploitation. And lastly, to be brought up in a spirit of friendship among people. Next, we're going to talk about the influences on child health promotion. The first thing we're going to address is family structure. Families have been defined in a number of different ways and are made up of individuals, each with a social recognized status and position who interact with one another in a socially sanctioned way. It is a group of two or more people related by birth, marriage, or adoption, and they live together or reside together. The United States Census Bureau uses four definitions for family. The first one is traditional nuclear family, married couple and their own biological child. Next, is the nuclear family. Two parents may or may not be married with children, may or may not be biological. So they could have kids that are step children, adoptive, half children, uh, or foster children. Blended or reconstituted family, which is one step parent, step siblings, or half siblings. Extended family. This is where there's at least one parent and child and one or more people other than the parent or siblings. Often here we see uh, grandparents are the extended family. Other families defined. So think single parenting. This is where one parent is raising the child. By nuclear parents, this is continuing the parenting role while terminating the spousal unit. This is sort of like um, joint custody. Polygamist. Not legal, but more often, more than one woman shares a husband with other women and children. Communal, this is fairly uncommon as well. Focuses the goals of the community, often share goods, and there is a reliance on each other. LGBTQ, here there is a legal or a common law tie between the people who are not cisgendered, male and female, who have children together. It is important to be open and non-judgmental when caring for these families. 
If you take a look in your book, you'll see a table that has qualities of strong families. Please make sure that you read it all. Um, I'm gonna highlight a few here. So what are some qualities of strong families? Number one, there is a commitment toward family well-being. Number two, they spend time together. They have a sense of purpose. They communicate in a positive manner. Manner. There is a clear set of family rules, values, and beliefs. There's a variety of coping strategies, and they are able to engage in problem-solving activities. They are flexible and adaptable. And lastly, they use a balance between the use of internal and external family resources for coping and adapting to life events and planning for the future. Next, we'll, we're gonna talk about parenting styles. Number one is the authoritarian or a dictatorial style. This is the required unquestioned rule following. You will, to do, you will do it because I said so. Next is the permissive or laissez-faire. Here there is little or no control over the children. There is inconsistent discipline. Authoritative or democratic style combines both of the previous styles. Control is firm and consistent, but it's tempered with encouragement and understanding. Limit setting and discipline. So limit setting refers to the establishment of rules or guidelines regarding behavior. Discipline refers to a set of rules governing conduct and actions taken to enforce the rules. So you gotta remember, you need to enforce the rules. Limit setting serves several functions. It serves to test their limit, limits of control, achieve in areas appropriate for mastery at their level, channel undesirable feelings into constructive activity, protect themselves from danger, and also it helps for them to learn how they can uh, determine their socially acceptable behavior. How can we minimize misbehavior? Well, we can set realistic goals for acceptable behavior and expected achievements. Structure op opportunities for small successes to lessen feelings of inadequacy. Praise children for desirable behavior with attention and verbal approval. This is when I say, catch kids being good. Structure the environment to prevent unnecessary difficulties. Meaning that if you have uh, beautiful glassware, put them high up so that way they don't break and kids can't get in touch with them. Set clear and reasonable rules. Expect the same behavior regardless of the circumstances. And if exceptions are made, clarify that the change is for one time only. Teach desirable behavior through your own example, such as using quiet, calm, voice rather than screaming. We can always tell when a parent screams at the home. Review expected behavior before special or unusual events, such as visiting a relative or having dinner in a rest restaurant. Phrase requests for appropriate behaviors positively, such as put the book down, tell the child what you want them to do versus what you don't want them to do. So this is rather than don't touch the book. It's very hard for a child to stop doing what they are doing once they've started it. Call attention to unacceptable behavior as soon as it begins. Use distraction to change the behavior or offer alternatives to annoying actions such as a quiet toy for one that is excessively noisy. Give advance notice or friendly reminders such as when the TV is over, it's time for dinner or I'll give you to the count of three and then we have to go. Be attentive to situations that increase the likelihood of misbehaving, such as overexcitement or fatigue, or a decrease of personal tolerance to minor infractions. Offer sympathetic explanations for not granting or 
requests such as, I am sorry I can't read you a story now, but I have to finish dinner. Then we can't spend time together. Keep any promises made to children. Avoid outright conflicts. Temper discussions with statements such as, let's talk about it and see what we can decide together. Or, I have to think about it first. Provide children with opportunities for power and control. Don't forget, give children the opportunity to have power and control. Implementing discipline. So there's lots of things we need to consider when we are implementing discipline. The first, not in any particular order, but the first one is consistency. We need to implement disciplinary actions exactly as agreed on for each infraction. Timing, initiate discipline as soon as child misbehaves. If there's a delay and necessary, please um, let them know that the behavior is not appropriate and that a disciplinary action will be implemented at a, date or at a later time. Um, we don't wanna embarrass the child. Commitment, follow through with the details of discipline, such as timing of minutes, avoid distractions that may interfere with the plan, such as telephone calls. Unity, make certain that all caregivers agree on the plan and are familiar with the details to prevent confusion and alliances between a child and another parent. Flexibility. Choose disciplinary strategies that are appropriate to the child's age, temperament, and the severity of the misbehavior. Planning. Plan discipline strategies in advance and prepare the child if feasible. So basically you wanna explain the use of a timeout before there's a need for a timeout. For unexpected misbehavior, try to discipline when you are calm. Behavior orientation. Always disapprove of the behavior, not the child, with such statements as, that was a wrong thing to do. I am happy when I see that behavior. You never want to tell a child. You're a bad child. Privacy. Administer discipline in a private uh, area, especially when children are older. You don't want them to feel ashamed in front of other people. Termination. Once the discipline is administered, consider the child having a clean slate. You don't want to bring it up again or continue lecturing. So let's talk a little bit about how do we effectively use time out. So first and foremost, you want to select an area for time out that is safe, convenient, and unstimulating, but where the child can still be monitored, such as a bathroom, hallway, or laundry room. We don't want to put them in a place that's scary. So please avoid a frightening area, <coughs> excuse me, such as a cellar or a dark closet. Determine what behaviors warrant a timeout. Make sure the children understand the rules and how they are expected to behave. Explain to children the process of a timeout when they misbehave. The will, they will be given one warning. If they don't obey, then they're going to be sent to the designated timeout area. They are then supposed to sit in that timeout area for a specific period of time. If they cry or refuse or display any kind of disruptive behavior, the timeout period will begin after they quiet down. When they are quiet for the duration of the time, then they can leave the timeout area. A rule for the length of timeout is one minute per year of age. It's beneficial to use a kitchen timer with an audible bell to record the time rather than a watch. Children are able to hear when the audible bell goes off. You want to implement timeout in a public place by selecting a suitable area if it's necessary when this occurs in a public place. But let's say that can't happen. You want to explain to the child that the timeout will spend and be spent immediately when they go home. And then you can even mark with a felt tint pen on their hand just as a reminder that once they get home, they will be in timeout for their misbehavior. Corporal punishment. This is not something that we recommend at all anymore. This is based on aversion therapy. 
it is inflicting pain upon through spanking and it causes a dramatic short-term uh, decrease in the behavior but there are many problems with spanking so again we do not um, encourage this in any way shape or form so what are some problems with spanking it teaches children that violence is acceptable many times the spanking is a result of parental rage and may fit they may physically harm the child children become accustomed to spanking requiring more severe corporal punishment each time kids that are spanked are less likely to learn what they should do because it focuses on what they shouldn't do when the parent is not around they may be in you know participating in behaviors that we don't want them to participate in because they haven't learned how to behave well for their own sake discipline techniques should help the child control their own behavior so what can we do withholding privileges imposing penalties penance activities contracting allow the child to participate in the process of determining appropriate disciplinary measures when necessary. Sadly, many children are a product of divorce. So what is the impact of divorce on children? In infancy, they might experience a lack of mothering, increased irritability, problem with eating, sleeping, and excreting. Two to three, they may be frightened and confused. They may blame themselves. They may be experiencing a fear of abandonment, increased irritability, whining tantrums and regressive behavior with separation anxiety three to five years of age they might experience a fear of abandonment blame themselves for the divorce decrease self-esteem become more aggressive in relationships with others like their siblings or peers as well as engaging in fantasies to seek understanding of the divorce five to six years of age they might be experiencing depression and immature behavior, loss of appetite and sleep disorders. They might be able to verbalize some feelings and understand some divorce related changes. They also might experience an increase in anxiety and aggression. Also, they might feel abandoned by the departing parent. Six to eight, here they might have panic reactions, feelings of deprivation, such as loss of apparent attention, money, and secure future. They might experience profound sadness, depression, fear, and insecurity, feelings of abandonment, and rejection, fear regarding the future, difficulty expressing anger at parents, intense desire for reconciliation of parents, impaired capacity to play, and they may really uh, decrease in their enjoyment of outside activities. They also may have a declination in school performance and an alteration in peer relationships. They might become bossy, irritable, demanding, and manipulative. They may cry frequently, have a loss of appetite, sleep problems, a disturbance in the routine, and forgetfulness. Ages nine through 12, here they have a more realistic understanding of divorce. They might experience intense anger directed at one or both parents. They may have divided loyalties. They may express feelings of anger, shame of parental behavior, and feel of the need for revenge. They also may wish to punish the parent they hold responsible. They can feel lonely and rejected and abandoned. They may experience altered peer relationships, a decline in school performance, and they may develop somatic complaints. Also, they can engage in aberrant behavior such as lying, stealing, temper tantrums, and dictatorial attitudes. Ages 12 through 18, here they're able to disengage themselves from parental conflict. They can feel a profound sense of loss of their family, childhood, feelings of anxiety. They can worry about themselves, parents, siblings. They might express anger, sadness, shame, embarrassment, they may withdraw from family and friends. They can have a disturbed concept of sexuality, and they may also engage in acting out behaviors. Let's talk a little bit about special parenting situations. 
first and foremost is a single parenting household. This is where one parent is raising the child. About 35% of children under 18 live in a single parent household, most of which are women. Problems include the children are more likely to stay poor, commit crimes, and be a source of disciplinary problems in school. The mother is often overtaxed as a nurturer and disciplinarian, as well as a breadwinner. Money, time, and energy are concerns for the single parent. Parenting in the reconstituted family. Here, there is an entry of a step parent which requires adjustment for all family members. Parenting tips for living. Let the relationship develop slowly and naturally. Don't criticize or try to replace the parent. Decide on standards of dis discipline and behavior and stick to them. Don't pretend everything is fine when it's not. Open communication is important. Cooperative or joint custody parenting, you wanna allow for each set of parents to be alone with their children. That way they can establish the relationship with them. Parenting in dual earner families. Here issues occur with a lot of overload. Um, this is a significant cause of stress. Um, time demands and scheduling can be major problems. Social activities are often significantly curtailed. Child care is critical to the working mother's well-being. Parents have to make sure they investigate child care services before they use them. Parenting the adoptive child. Here, the most problems faced by adoptive parents are really no different than the natural parents. The sooner the infant becomes uh, aware that they are part of an adoptive family, the better. Uh, the sooner the infant enters adoptive home, the better for parental bonding. Most authorities believe that a child should be informed of this adoption so they don't ever remember a time that they did not know that they were not adopted. Children may use the fact that they are adopted to manipulate their parents. They need the same love, discipline, and limit setting as all of their children. Sometimes they might wanna know about their bi biological parents. Um, and this is the reason that might happen is because they wanna define their own identity. This is definitely a lot easier now and definitely possible in multiple states. Next, we're gonna talk about family structure. Please be aware, this is very generalized. So please don't take this information and run with it. Um, so in general, the firstborn are concerned with achievement. They are more dominant. They plan better and experience fewer frustrations. Middle children, they have more of a demand for household help. They unfortunately tend to be praised less often. They learn to compromise and be more adaptive, which is a good thing. The last born or the baby of a the family, they tend to be more outgoing, less tense, more affectionate, good natured, and have fewer demands placed on them for chores. Sociocultural and environmental influences are many. So these would include school and learning environment, peer cultures, social roles, co-cultural influences, local community influences, race, ethnicity, social class, poverty, religion, and mass media. So let's take a look at school first. So before five years of age, many children participate in developmental schools. But at approximately five to six years of age, they spend about five, uh, six to eight hours of school each and every single day during the week. Uh, physical skill and social interactions are learned. They can also learn about health and nutrition. Stress. What kind of stressful events can occur in childhood? Moving, new schools, divorce, and abuse. Signs and symptoms of stress in children include regressive behaviors, poor sleep, hyperactivity, GI signs and symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation. 
withdrawal of normal events as well as crying that would not normally be expected. Community. If a social, uh, basically, if they have social and after school programs and safe parks, this is wonderful. But if they are economically depressed, they have few services and have a high homicide rate, this is not good for children. Communities can be sites of opportunity and growth for children and families. Communities can also be a site where poverty and disenfranchisement are minimized through connections with high quality early childhood education. Also, job training for adolescents and parents and safe, effective schools can all improve a community. Communities can also contribute to toxic stress if violence and poverty are pervasive and resources are absent. Social economic. Low social economic status can lead to poor nutrition, a lack of immunizations, an increase in injuries, an increase in teen pregnancy, homelessness, as well as a lack of health insurance. Poverty. Poverty can be defined in a few different ways. Physical poverty refers to a lack of money or material resources. This includes poor nutrition, insufficient clothing, poor sanitation, and deteriorating housing. Invisible poverty refers to social and cultural deprivation, such as limited employment opportunities, lack of or inferior healthcare services, and an absence of public services. Because of the evolving demographics in the United States, it is critical for the pediatric nurse to care for children and families in an open, culturally humble manner. The family's religious orientation dictates a code of behavior and influences the family's attitudes towards education. Male and female role identities and various aspects of their life need to be considered when we're looking at the family's religious orientation. It may also influence the school that the children attend or the community in which the family embeds itself. Let's take a look at some guidelines for integrating spiritual care into the pediatric nursing practice. What do we need to think about here? Well, first of all, we need to respect the child and the family's religious belief and practices. Consider the children's development when talking about spiritual concerns. Contact the institution's chaplaincy department for patients and families who have symptoms of spiritual distress or ask for specific religious rituals. Become knowledgeable about the religious worldviews of cultural groups found in the patients you care for. Encourage visitation with family members, members of the patient's spiritual community, and spiritual leaders. Allow children and families to teach you about the specifics of their religious beliefs. Develop awareness of your own spiritual perspective and listen for understanding rather than agreement or dis disagreement. Media, violence on TV or screen time and video games associated with aggressive behavior. There is an increase in cyberbullying. There is also noted an increased amount of time watching TV or screen time is associated with an increase in weight, alcohol, and tobacco and vaping products. Uh, the reason is, is these are often uh, marketed to youth. Body image dissatisfaction can also be done or observed because there is a realistic, unrealistic portrayal in the media. Sexual content in the media can contribute to beliefs and attitudes about sex, sexual behavior, and initiation of intercourse. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends no more than two hours of age-appropriate TV or screen time per day for children two years old and over. Uh, under the year of two years of age, there should not be TV. Studies also show that children who watch TV or have screen time more than one hour a day do have higher rates of obesity. 
Race is a term that groups together people by their outward physical appearance. Race is a socially constructed term with roots in anthropology, distinguishing varieties in humans by physical traits. Culture, here this basically characterizes a particular group with its values, beliefs, norms, patterns, and practices which are learned, shared, and transmitted from one generation to another. This can influence attitudes towards touching and appropriate behavior based on gender. Ethnicity. This is the affiliation of a set of persons who share a unique cultural, social, and linguistic heritage. Ethnicity is a classification aimed at grouping individuals who consider themselves or are considered by others to share common characteristics that differentiate them from other collectives in a society and from which they develop their distinctive cultural behavior. Health beliefs and practices. Beliefs related to the causes of illness and maintenance of health are integral parts of a family's cultural heritage. The concept of balance or equilibrium is widespread throughout the world. One of the most common imbalances is the one between hot and cold. This can help nurses to understand why patients do or do not want to eat certain foods or fluids. Some folk remedies are compatible with medical regime and are useful to reinforce the treatment plan. Nurses must respect practices that do not harm patients and then educate people when the practices can cause harm. This is why it's so important to be very aware of the different kinds of uh, therapeutic or non-therapeutic cultural uh, practices in each practice of the different cultures. Please be aware that nutrition is the single most important influence on growth for all ages. So next we're gonna talk about growth, concepts of growth and development. So what is growth? This is really very easy to measure. This looks at quantitative changes. We're gonna look at an increase in physical size. We can measure the height, the weight, the head circumference. Development. This is an increase in capability or functioning. This is qualitative changes or mastery of skills. Here we're gonna see more complex and less easily measured skills. There's a gradual change from lower to more advanced stages of complexity. Differentiation. This is a process in development where unspecialized cells are systematically modified to achieve specific physical forms, physiologic function, and chemical properties, such as stem cells differentiate to B and T cells. Maturation. This is the process of developing, including physical, emotional, and intellectual abilities that let one function at a higher level and adapt in the environment. This basically shows an increase in competence, adaptability, and generally tends to occur with aging. So what is a developmental milestone? This is a physical or cognitive skill that a person accomplishes during a set age period to continue developing. So let's look at human development. So we do know that human development follows a set direction and sequence. It goes from simple to complex. So first a baby will coo, and then shortly after they will start to form words. It also goes from general to specific. First there's a palmer grasp, and then you're gonna have fine, fine finger movements. It also goes from head to toe or cephalocaudal. First you're gonna have control movement of the head and neck, and then the body, and then the limbs. It also goes from inner to outer, or also called proximal distal. The arms are coordinated before the hands and fingers. Predictability, although development occurs 
in a set order, there is a wide range of normal. Children can walk as early as nine months and as late as 15 months, and this is considered normal. But we do know that children follow a consistent pattern. So a child that starts to develop early tends to stay with a pattern of developing early. A child that is developing late, although still within the normal range, may tend to stay within the late rate of development. When children learn new developmental skills, know that the new developmental skill would predominate over the older skills that they've developed. Temperament. This is one's behavior style or approach to people in situations. There are three patterns, but please note, 35% of children have some, but not all char characteristics in one category. So the easy child. This child has a positive mood. They easily adapt to new situations and stimuli. They are accepting of new rules and they tend to work well with others. The difficult child. Here they generally have a negative mood. They have intense reactions to the environment. They slowly adapt to new people and new situations. They tend to be highly active, irritable, and a little bit irregular in their habits. The slow to warm up child. Here they are initially withdrawn and then they slowly interact with the environment. They tend to be quiet, have mild reactions, and have a slow adaptation to new situations. Next, we're gonna talk about a wide variety of theorists. First, we're gonna talk about Freud. So Freud, his first stage includes the oral stage, and this is birth to one year. Here, the child gets pleasure and comfort from the mouth. That's, that's why it's called the oral stage. So sucking, eating, eating. Nursing applications. Give the infant a pacifier if they are NPO or after an unpleasant procedure. Anal stage, one to three years of age. Gratification is obtained by controlling bodily excretions. Nursing applications. Follow toilet training rituals at home and within the hospital. Know the words that they use for number one and number two for voiding and BM. Don't start to toilet train in the hospital because you might see regression regarding toilet training when they are hospitalized. They might actually wet the bed when they're in the hospital, but they didn't wet the bed at home. Please note that children had, that had rigid Severe toilet training uh, often show meticulous and hypercritical behaviors later in life. Phallic is three to six. Here initially the child identifies with the parent of the opposite sex, but by the end of this stage they identify with a parent of the same sex. Here as a nurse you wanna to try to assign the registered nurse that the child's gonna be most comfortable with. Latency, six to 12. Here, privacy and understanding of the body is important. So as a nurse, we need to remember to please knock on doors, provide gowns and proper draping, and then please, again, explain treatments and procedures that are age appropriate. Genital stage, 12 to 18 years of age. Here you wanna focus on genital function and relationships. As a nurse, we need to reinforce GYN exams testicular self-exams. We want to give them information on sexuality and birth control and definitely provide privacy during health care. Next, we're going to talk about Erickson, and he developed a theory of psychosocial development. He identified eight periods of time in one's life. Each developmental crisis must be met to successfully move on to the next. If it's not met, then it negatively affects future social relationships. We're only gonna talk about the first five because the last three have to do with adults and that's not what this class is going to deal with. So first, trust versus mistrust. Birth through about a year. Trust is fostered by having all of the needs met. Mistrust develops if basic needs are inconsistently or inadequately met. So what are we gonna do as a nurse? 
We want to offer comfort after a procedure, meet hygiene and other physical and social needs. Autonomy versus shame and doubt. This is about one to three years of age. The development of autonomy is centered on children's increasing ability to control their bodies. Independence is shown by saying no, as well as controlling excrement and directing motor activity. If they're criticized or unsuccessful, they may develop a sense of shame and doubt. Nursing. We want to allow the child to feed themselves, encourage to dress themselves, and participate in hygiene activities. If restraining, restraining a child, do so quickly with explanation. Initiative versus guilt, three to six years of age. Here they participate in vigorous, intrusive behavior. They have a strong imagination. They demonstrate initiative by being able to formulate and carry out a plan of action. They like to start new activities, uh, participate in new ideas, and explore the world. They develop a sense of conscience. When made to feel that their activities or imaginings are bad produces a sense of guilt. When efforts to engage in physical and imaginative play are stifled by caregivers, children begin to feel that their self-initiated behaviors are a source of embarrassment. So what can we do? We want to encourage them to draw as a means of expressing their feelings and acknowledge them and let them play with medical equipment to decrease their anxiety. Industry versus inferiority. This is six to 12. Here they gain a sense of self-worth from involvement in activities. If successful, they develop a sense of confidence and they enjoy learning about new things. If they're compared to others, they may develop feelings of inadequacy. Inferiority may develop if too much is expected. As a nurse, we can encourage them to continue their schoolwork or participate in favorite pastimes that they participated in home. Identity versus role confusion. This is 12 to 18. Here you search for identity. They want independence from their parents and there's an increase in reliance on their peers. There's a rapid and marked physical change and there's a preoccupation with physical appearance. Their peer group is very important. If successful, they develop confidence and self-identity. If they're unable to make meaningful definition of self, they develop role confusion. So what can we do as a nurse? We want to do history and physicals alone with the team. Let them meet other teams with similar health problems. Provide separate areas from small children for teens only, like a recreation room. Next, we're going to talk about Piaget's cognitive learning theory. Cognitive development is influenced by age and maturity ability. The child incorporates new experiences via assimilation, meaning that they absorb information, and changes to deal with experiences by accommodation, which means they adjust or they adapt. So the first stage is sensory motor. This is from birth to two years of age. And here they learn about the world with their senses and motor activities. There's six substages in this area. So the first one is they're gonna use their reflex, reflexes. Birth to one month of age. Here they receive stimulation by using reflexes. So first learning can occur. Primary circular reaction, reactions is one to four months. Pleasure is gained from relax, reflexes, which causes repetition. They grasp a rattle, it makes a noise, the baby likes how it sounds, and then they grasp it again. Secondary circular reactions, four to eight months. Here, they are beginning to connect cause and effect. They are happy when the bottle is being prepared or when the mother unbuttons their blouse to breastfeed. They will also try to uncover a partially hidden object. Number four, coordination of secondary schemes. This is eight to 12 months. By the time a child is about 10 months of age, they are developing object permanence. So it's no longer out of sight, out of mind. 
They also perform intentional behaviors to get objects. They create sounds, they associate symbols with events, so when somebody waves goodbye, they understand that that person is leaving. Tertiary circular reactions. This is 12 to 18 months. Here they're exploring actions to learn results. They might get an object and look at it at different angles, bang on it, place it in their mouth to explore uses and see how the object is being used. They can use achievement experimentation or trial and error to do what they couldn't do in the past. But please note, they don't transfer new information to different situations. So each time they see it, they examine the object again. They can see a telephone in one room and then re-examine it in a different room. Or when they see a light switch, they can play with it in one room and then play with it in a different room as if they've never seen it before. Number six, mental combinations. This is 18 to 24 months. Language helps children to think about events or objects before or after they occur. It helps children to understand the world. It also helps to increase their development of object permanence. Um, so here, this is occurring because they now will search for things that have been hidden. Uh, they participate in domestic mimicry. Um, they will imitate household chores. They will imitate actions, gestures, and words. So parents need to be very cautious about what they say and what they do because children will copy them. The next phase is pre-operational, and this occurs between two and seven years of age. Children use language and have a growing understanding of the past, present, and future. This has two stages. So the first one is preconceptual, which occurs between two and four years of age. And here they can only see things from their own perspective. The child is very egocentric. Logic is not developed. The second phase is between four and seven. And this is the intuitive substage, which uses transductive reasoning, meaning that they will draw conclusions from one fact to another, such as if they got sick because they were bad, or if they got appendicitis because the dog's tail hit them in the stomach, then they got sick, which of course doesn't make any sense to us. Um, they also have magical thinking, which means they can think things happen because of their thoughts or wishes. If they got mad at their sibling, they could say, I wish they were dead. And then unfortunately that happens, they actually believe that they caused this to happen. So it's important for the nurse to tell the child that they are not responsible for their illness or the illness or injury of anybody else. The third phase is concrete operational, also called perceptual thinking. This typically occurs between seven and 11 years of age. Here, they're able to reason cause and effect. They can develop the ability to problem solve, understand rules and base judgments on reason. They need to be able to manipulate objects and see objects. That's why we call this concrete thinking. They master concepts of conservation, such as environmental properties don't change just because it looks different, such as one tall glass and one short glass may have the same amount of water, but it looks different. They understand it still has the same amount. They also like to classif classify things, so they can group similar things together. They like to collect things like coins, stamps, shells, and other kinds of stuffed animals. Reversibility is the ability to think through an action and its benefit versus its consequences. If they're playing chess, they can think, should I make this move which causes this result or make an other move causing a different result? They also learn to read. What can we do as a nurse? Let them see and touch the equipment to be used. Give clear instructions for treatment and procedures. Lastly, is the formal operational. This is also called conceptual thinking. So this develops between 11 and 15 years of age, but they should have formal operations throughout their life. This is the ability to think abstractly and consider different alternatives and outcomes. They should be able to determine logical consistency or inconsistencies. So 
if the parents tell a child, don't cheat on something, but they're cheating on their taxes, they're going to call them on it. You want to teach them to be honest, and you need to do that through role playing. So as a nurse, what are we going to do? You want to give them verbal and written information and a full explanation of treatments as well as everything that's going to happen in terms of the procedures. Lastly is Colbert. So this has three levels and each level has two stages. The first level is pre-conventional morality. At the pre-conventional level, and this is like around nine years and maybe under, maybe a hair over, um, they don't have a personal code of morality. Instead, it's shaped by the standards of adults and the consequences of following or breaking the rules. Authority is outside the individual and reasoning is based on the physical con consequences of actions. The first part is obedience and punishment orientation. The child is good in order to avoid being punished. If a person is punished, they must have done something wrong. Stage two is individualism and exchange. At this stage, children recognize that there is not just one right view that is handed down by authorities. Different individuals have different viewpoints. Level two, conventional morality. At the conventional level, and this is most adolescents and adults, we begin to internalize the moral standards of valued adult role models. Conformity and loyalty to the family occurs. Authority is internalized but not questioned, and reasoning is based on the norms of the group to which the person belongs. So stage three in level two is good and per interpersonal relationships. The person is good in order to be seen as being a good person by others. Therefore, answers relate to the approval of others. Stage four, maintaining social order. The person becomes aware of the wider rules of society. So judgments concerning obeying the rules in order to uphold the law and to avoid guilt, that's what is occurring here. Level three, this is post-conventional morality. This again is divided into two areas. Um, so here, individual judgment is based on self-chosen principles and moral reasoning is based on individual rights and justice. According to Kohlberg, this level of moral reasoning is as far as most people get. Only 10 to 15 percent are capable of the kind of abstract thinking necessary for stage five or six. That is to say, most people take their moral views from those around them, and only a minority think through ethical principles for themselves. So stage five, social contract and individual rights. The person becomes aware that while rules and laws might exist for the good of the greater number, there are times when they will work against the interest of particular individuals. The issues are not always clear cut. For example, the protection of life is more important than breaking the law against stealing. Stage six, universal principles. People at this stage have developed their own set of moral guidelines, which may or may not fit the law. Principles apply to er everyone. Examples include human rights, justice, and equality. The person will be prepared to act to defend these principles, even if it means going against the rest of society in the process and having to pay the consequences of disapproval and or imprisonment. Kohlberg doubted few people reach this stage. Development of self-concept. So what is our self-concept? This is how an individual describes him or herself including all notions, beliefs, and convictions that constitute an individual's self-knowledge and that influence that influences relationships with others. To develop a positive self-concept, children need recognition for their achievements and the approval of others. Body image. 
This is the subjective concept and attitude that individuals have towards their own bodies. Self-esteem, this is the value that individuals place on themselves and refers to an overall evaluation of oneself. What is the role of play in development? Children can learn through play what adults are unable to teach them. They can learn about their world and how they deal with and operate within their environment. Play should follow a directional trend of simple to complex. Through the universal medium of play, children learn what nobody can teach them. Play is the work of children. So let's talk a little bit about the content of play. The content of play follows the directional trend of simple to complex, although social relationships cannot be ignored. Social effective play begins with play where the infant takes pleasure in relationships with people. Since pleasure play is a non-social stimulating experience, it originates from without. Objects in the environment attract children's attention, stimulating the senses and gives pleasure. Skills play after infants have developed the ability to grasp and manipulate an object persistently, they demonstrate and exercise the newly acquired abilities through skill play by repeating an action over and over again. Unoccupied behavior, in unoccupied behavior, children are not playful, but focusing their attention momentarily on anything that strikes their interest. Dramatic or pretend play, also called symbolic play is the predominant play in preschool. They act out events of daily life. Games. Children of all cultures engage in games alone and with other preschoolers uh, and people of other ages. Please remember preschoolers hate to lose and they will cheat to win. School age and adolescents also enjoy competitive games. Types of play according to social development. So an infant, about zero to 12 months, may engage in solitary play. So they play alone. They play with different toys than others around them. Uh, they will play with rattles, cloth books, musical devices, colorful mobiles, and squeaky toys. The toddler, one to three years of age, may engage in parallel play. They will play next to each other with little or no social interaction. They will play with uh, pool toys, big wheels. They might use similar toys as others are using, uh, but they are not influenced by others playing around them. Preschool is three to six. Here they participate in associative play. Children interact with each other. They engage in similar activities and they will participate in groups. They play house, build Legos, but there is no organization with the play and they sort of do their own thing. School age, six to 12 years of age. Here you're gonna see cooperative play. Children learn to put the needs of the group ahead of their own. In the United States, winning is a significantly emphasized. This is not necessarily the case with other cultures. Children tend to join into groups to achieve a goal while playing a game. They understand the rules and the roles in the game. Onlooker play. Here, one watches others' activities with interest, but there is no movement to participate. So let's talk a little bit about the functions of play. Play enhances sensory motor development, intellectual development, socialization, creativity, self-awareness, and moral standards. Please note that I said enhances. It does not mean that it can make it happen faster. It just enhances your sensory motor and development. It does not make sensory motor development happen quicker. Play is therapeutic at any age. Although no scientific evidence shows that any toy is necessary for optimal learning, toys offer an opportunity to bring children and parents together. The type of toys chosen by or provided for children can support and enhance children's development. 
toys that are small replicas of culture and its tools help children assimilate into their culture. Toys that require pushing, pulling, rolling, and manipulating teach them about physical properties of the item and help build muscles and coordination. Rules and basic elements of organization are learned through board games. Next, let's talk a little bit about developmental assessment. The ages and stages developmental screening test. Basically, this includes 19 age-specific surveys that ask parents about developmental skills common in daily life for children. This assesses development in four categories in children aging in range from one to 66 months. The four categories include physical, intellectual, language, and social emotional. Parents fill this out and if there's a problem, further screening is done. A developmental assessment determines whether the child has mastered certain expected accomplishments during a developmental stage. If not, subsequent tasks may be delayed. So the Denver Developmental II test was something that was commonly used in the past, but it's not really recommended anymore. The reason it's not recommended so much anymore is that it's been seen to be insensitive and it lacks specificity according to the American Academy of Neurology and Child Neurology Society. Lastly, for week one, part A, we're gonna talk about the adjusted age. This is basically something that we do for premature infants. This is used when describing the developmental age of a premature infant. The number of weeks premature is subtracted from the chronicle chronological age to determine the infant's developmental age. This is used until they are two years of age. So a child born four weeks early and is now 16 weeks of age. So if we look at 16 weeks of age minus four for the being four weeks early looks like 12 weeks of age. So we are now going to assess the child at 12 weeks of age milestones. So this concludes the lecture addressing the behavioral objectives for week one, part A. Please be sure to read the textbook and complete the assignments for this week to facilitate the utilization of this content and applying it to nursing practice. Thanks and have a good day. Don't forget, please make sure that you watch part B for week one. Have a good day. Bye-bye.